I'm Linda Reinstein, the executive director and co-founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. And in 2006, I joined hundreds of thousands of other victims when I became a mesothelioma widow and single parent. Today, I'd like to focus on building your roadmap for those who have been exposed to asbestos or diagnosed with an asbestos-caused cancer. As the executive director of ADAO, Myself and other volunteers filled numerous emails, phone calls, and letters asking, what do I do if I've been exposed? What do I do if my child played with that toy that was contaminated? I have been exposed. Can you, can you refer me to a, a team of doctors that can help me? People are bewildered, and they come to us. So we're hoping that this segment, as broad as it is, will at least give people some tools and some resource and background information that might become usable. So it's all about taming chaos here and making informed choices for today, the future, and for living your life. It's not about the right path, and there are no absolutes in building your roadmap. You need, to, you need to choose what feels right to you and what is right for you. And the information I share today is both from personal experiences as well as organizational. As a disclaimer, I am not a doctor nor an attorney, so I am not offering any sort of advice only what I've learned the very, very hard way. During my presentation, I'm going to use uh, the acronym ARD for asbestos-related disease, and also the word victim, which sometimes pushes uh, doctors in the medical community because no, wants to, won't, no one wants to feel like a victim. We all want to be superheroes. But when we go to Washington, D.C., and we talk about the asbestos crisis that is that has caused the largest man-made disaster in public history, there's not one word that describes the victim, living or deceased, their family that's affected, and anyone that's also been exposed and their family. So you'll hear me use the word victim, and it's not in the submissive sense at all. We know that asbestos diseases affect the entire family. These four points illuminate the strategy that the Reinstein family was forced to embrace during Allen's mesothelioma battle. There's an unpredictability that we face with the, when you're exposed or diagnosed with asbestos diseases. And if you can balance these four points, your roadmap will become easier for you to navigate and you can focus on your life. Now, we know that we could spend the entire day just talking about, talking about evaluating, discussing the psychological, the physical, the psychosocial, and the financial issues that plague an, an asbestos family, but we don't have all day. So the staging, it's important to remember that the staging is often difficult. Treatment options are baffling. The financial issues are complex. The psychological issues are at best challenging. And the psychosocial issues facing the entire family are life-changing. There is no going back. There is no rewind button. And after the patient dies, the family is left to, to fend for themselves with these issues. I want to break up my presentation today talking about the exposed and the diagnosed so we can think about a plan for both groups of people because as with information that you've heard Dr. Ruchtischel and Dr. Harvard and Dr. Lemon and, the, and, and Dr. Klein talk about, we need to get in front of, the, of exposure to prevent these diseases. So the more we educate, the more fear, unfortunately, we do stir up. This is not a panic-based, fear-based initiative. This is sound education, but we need to educate people now about becoming exposed because that's quite alarming, the amount of emails that I, that I do get. Um, so take a minute and think about frontline education. If or should you be exposed, can you answer these important questions? And for some of you, you may, I may actually have to educate your primary physician. Now, our website has early warning symptoms, high-risk occupations, and prevention information in English, Spanish, and French for free. So maybe you'd like to share that with some of your colleagues. Oops, sorry about that. It's all about getting organized, and then you can go back to living your life, because some of you will never be diagnosed with an ARD. And some doctors are not very good about asking the questions that need to be asked to identify exposure to then evaluate disease and diagnose disease. When my husband Alan was asked, have you ever been exposed to asbestos? He answered no. He was a businessman. But if the doctor had asked, did you ever work in a shipyard? Did you ever do home repairs? How about floor tiles? The answer would have been yes. So we need to know how to collect the data, compile it. Long latency periods make this process nearly impossible. Can you remember what you had for dinner last night? 
I know I can't. So let's start, if you've been exposed, think about the things that might help you uh, in the future, God forbid, if you are diagnosed with a disease. Being proactive and aware won't, won't be a negative, it'll only be a positive. If you're diagnosed, becoming informed is monumentally critical to your care. Uh, patients that are unfamiliar with ARD and when they are diagnosed, they feel paralyzed and overwhelmed. Evaluating your treatment options become even more difficult. You must stay informed, ask the questions, go to resource centers, and on our website we have a lot of, of great recommendations. It takes an expert team to help you map your plan. And you may only have two of these professionals, or you may have all nine like the Reinstein family. Understanding your options and choosing the treatment options will be easier if you can manage your care. Keep your team well informed and encourage collaborative exchange of information, test results. I don't think I ever walked out after Alan having a CT scan that I didn't ask. Could you please fax it to here and send it to there? And although we may think we're being a royal pain, and some of the doctors may not, yes, at the end of the day, when they need to find that report, it's a much easier thing to be able to pull up a chart when it's there versus trying to call the institute that did the CAT scan and diagnostic testing to beg, please, can you send it straight out of the gate? We know that managing these diseases uh, is a full-time job, and you need to become your own best advocate, but also accept help. Family, friends, and professionals are willing to help you. And remember, you're not alone. So if you're diagnosed, how can you remain organized? Um, I had a binder. I have forms and charts and Excel spreadsheets that I make available to many patients that email me. And I found that being uh, organized allowed us to maximize the time with our doctors. Healthcare has changed dramatically. Some doctors see anywhere from 25 to 40 patients a day. So if you go in organized, you present the information that's routinely asked, your prescriptions and your symptoms, and there it's all important information. But if you can go in with something in a sheet, they collect, they'd review it, put it in the file, and we could move on to asking those really important questions like, any treatment changes, anything new on the market, what about this symptom? And we found that to be very effective for our family. If you live alone, you need to keep a journal. Uh, it's impossible to remember the day-to-day -day changes uh, if you're by yourself. And also, check with your fire department. We talk about these the, uh, remaining organized. Ask your fire department, do you guys go for that uh, centralized information on the refrigerator? Because most do now. And I'd have an envelope there with Alan's advanced directives, contact information, doctors, on the refrigerator. If I wasn't there, which I never left Alan, but if, if, if some, a companion was with him and I wasn't home, they needed to know where to gather the information. So think proactively. You know, it's like an emergency kit in California. We all have them underneath our stairs. Well, it's time to think preventatively and, and proactively with our care. This is a hard one. For anybody who's heard me speak before, uh, trauma and the psychological components of asbestos-caused diseases is really important because I know firsthand what it's like to have your loved one diagnosed with asbestos-caused cancer, check out the diagnosis in a computer, recognize you have 6 to 12 months, maybe, and that it is a preventable disease. It's traumatic. Uh, you've, you can just go through these sim simple um, descriptions here, but this, and this is meant to be just an overview. But I think that Tannis and Kimberly and Dr. Black have an amazing system at the Card Clinic, and she has a pamphlet that she, I know would be willing to share. So seek out Tannis and Kimberly later on. I like that quote that you put on there. I think it's really important. Um, as Dr. Lemon pointed out, suicide. We've had mercy killings. We've had suicide. Um, there's a lot of problems that asbestos disease causes that aren't recognizable in pathology and x-rays. Psychosocial, you heard an excellent presentation by Dr. Klein, but I, I, wa I want to touch a bit on, on the other aspects from a victim's perspective and an executive director. How can you improve the quality of your life? You need to learn to adapt to this new normal. And the new normal might not just be the April 1st, it might change again in June, and it may change again in December. It will never be the same. For Alan, using a walker was overwhelming. He was a former marathon runner. But if it meant using a walker and being able to go to Emily's open house, we did it. He was tethered to oxygen, also embarrassing for a very well-fit man before his diagnosis. But if it meant going to the temple to watch Emily be bat mitzvah, he wore it. 
In the latter stages, it was a wheelchair, again, in and out of the car. Oh, Linda, I just can't do this. And I'm saying, no one cares. It's our family. It's what we think is right for you. You're the pathfinder. And he's like, okay, Linda, let's take the chair. It made us able to live our life. And you need to get out your calendar. Put in a date. Plan something. Go to a museum and spend $5 to buy a ticket. How about a movie ticket? Put some things on your calendar. If you only live to manage your appointments, your life is very, very lost in, the, in, in trying to manage your disease. And I'll say I learned this a hard way because the fear factor was intense. Every cough made me say, Alan, are you okay? Did you take your medicine? I mean, I look back and I think, you know, it's a whirly bird, bird feeling. So those quiet moments where you can just be a family, share a dinner, um, look for some normalcy. The patient doesn't want to be asked every second, are you okay and how are you feeling? Have a conversation and don't ask, are you sick, how are you feeling? Just be normal. Talk about politics. Plenty of discussion topics there. But, but, but seriously, try, try to live some time in, in your life without conversation. Now, I have to make a confession. Frankly, I was very embarrassed to admit this to you folks, but I think it's important. And I didn't understand the depth of knowledge that so social workers had. I always thought they were primarily there for um, abused women and battered children. And I didn't fall into either one of those cate categories. And I never th sought them out. I am very, very wrong. And some of the best information that I found and came from my social workers. And if you look at that slide, what does that mean? Home health care, transportation, how can you be a caregiver and manage your children's carpool and medication? The myriad of questions that, that come to you during the night are difficult to answer. Keep a little notepad. When you next go into your doctors, most hospitals have in sta on staff social workers, and oncology centers do. Right, Marianne, I suspect? Ask your doctor, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Where can I go? And I bet they'd send you to a social worker's office who is very compassionate, it's very private, kind of like seeing a therapist with an amazing resource guide. Seek it out. This was also difficult. The repetitive information, it was like a bad groundhog day for me to always explain to friends, families, and colleagues. And yet they loved and cared about our family, so I needed to keep them educated. So if you want to keep people informed, consider some of these amazing new websites that are free. You could build your own Share the Care network. You can, this is, happens to be one of my favorite sites. So maybe you need to have food delivered um, on Thursday night because you have a long chemotherapy session, or, or have your dog walked because you're out all day long. You can calendar your request to your families and friends, and truthfully, they'd always say, Linda, how can I help? And if I wasn't very organized, I couldn't really uh, employ them to help. And it was really wonderful to find out that they helped, they felt gratified, um, and this, these computer programs are amazing. So take a look at, uh, this one is from Lots of Helping Hands, and it's one of my favorites because it calendarizes it very well. You can post your patient updates, send emails, and it's also, there are some people that contact us that don't have computers. So you need to have a strategy for those that are older that may not want to share and maybe don't have computers. So designate a family member or friend to share the pertinent information. It doesn't have to come all from the patient and caregiver. Phone machines may be fine for you also to, to update your family members on a CAT scan result. And for others, protecting your privacy is equally as important. Remember, this is your map. You build it. You use it, and you share it as you see fit. Caregivers are patients, too. I learned this the hard way. You can't neglect yourself. Those basic tenets of, of, of simple living, when you're caregiving 24-7, you don't even remember. And it's not that you're being some great martyr by doing this so-called job, but, you, you know, it's, it's inseparable. Love and caregiving are inseparable. And there's no spouse that wants to turn her husband over to some other care agency. That wasn't an option for us. But 24-7 made it demanding. So schedule some, some time for yourself. It doesn't have to be 50, 15 minutes. It can be a day. Take time off. It's all about renewing and recharging yourself. Identify, I am the caregiver. You know, it's not a bad thing. You're not, you know, declaring that you have, you know, I don't know, a scarlet letter on your chest. You know, you need a little extra help. Give to yourself. You'll be a better caregiver in the end. Okay, this is, this is life. This portion of my presentation is all of, uh, for life for all of us. Now, this LIFE acronym breaks down certain issues that we should all focus on. This is not meant for a terminally ill patient. It's meant for everyone in this audience. So think about it. Legal, insurance, financial, end of life. There isn't anyone sitting here today with or without disease that's exempt from this sort of life planning. 
So again, I am not an attorney, but I'm telling you from personal experience what I've learned. How many of you have life plans in place? We all should. You need to seek professional assistance and invest in your plan in time and money. Once you have a plan, you go back to living. And again, this is just personal. Estate planning is really complicated and for me it was emotionally difficult because Alan was diagnosed with a terminal disease. No matter how much mommy magic I tried to spend, I knew my husband one day was going to die. Um, but we didn't think of it in that way, but estate planning was painful. But work through the pain. Um, recognize that once you complete these, do these documents, put them in your life binder. It provides you clarity and, commu and consistency for your family. If you don't share your plan with your family, there's a very big misunderstandings and eruptions that can happen within the family by these things not being discussed. Review your policies. Work with a professional. Understand insurance coverage and your next step plan. How many of you know what your lifetime maximum benefit is? Are you eligible for other, other insurance policies? Don't be afraid to ask. And if you need help filing your insurance forms, again, your friends and families will have offered. It was amazing. More people asked me, can I help you filing your insurance forms? And I thought, oh, that's such a strange, odd thing. But actually, for some people who work at night, they want to take home a task. And so think about having somebody help you. Financial. Let's face it, loss of income, excessive medical bills, increased health care, it's, it's enormous. It creates a huge burden, financial burden, emotional burden. I see Jill nodding in the back. We've all experienced. For Alan to, to be diagnosed and ultimately die of mesothelioma cost us over a million dollars, not out of cash. We had, thank God we had insurance. It's a costly disease to have. So take a look at your benefit plans. Make the inquiries whether or not you're eligible for a certain state and federal program. There is no magic here, but a plan will help you be better prepared for financial difficulties. Okay, everybody's uncomfortable with this slide. We all want to run and hide when we think about end of life. And initially, I too felt the same way. But Alan taught me something very special, that if he had his plan, that he invested his thoughts and requests to. It made us both ultimately feel stronger and better equipped. He also left legacy letters. And I will tell you that that's a treasure for Emily and I to go back in his handwriting and read these notes. They're treasures. So whether or not you have a disease, think about writing a note, an ethical will. Think about the future. Put it in a binder walk away and go on living your life. Life is about living, it's not about death. Okay, straight from the Reinstein School of Heart Knox, you can tell I'm a business girl at heart, but I had to come up with some ways that I blended almost magic and humor to balance what was affecting our family. I learned everything the hard way. And the two points on, on my list that I think are most important that I learned probably at the very end was live life and use your calendar. We'd plan trips and then we'd cancel them. I learned to buy travel insurance and accept that new normal because there is no normal with an asbestos-related disease. But don't live fatalistically. Live to live. Okay, you could imagine. We use laughter. Black humor, dark humor, old comics, whatever it is. What, you can't really laugh yourself well like they have that uh, psychiatrist at UCLA wrote this whole program, Laugh your, Yourself Well. I'm not going to be silly and ask a mesothelioma to do that and insult them. But I will tell you, humor is a good thing. So where, wherever it takes you, you know, Saturday Night Live and beyond, find your, find your funny bone and share it with your mate. Because laughter can be incredi incredible medicine. And actually, it's a healthy exercise. When you laugh, your bodies produce a uh, release endorphins, the chemical that help you um, counter counterbalance stress. It's like running a marathon. So the takeaway from today, you've gotten a piece of my life and my family. And please remember to live well, love much, and laugh often.